In the next hour, we're joined by William N. Gregg. WillGregg.com is his website. He writes for the New American Magazine. He's produced uh, quite a few excellent films that I'm a big uh, fan of, the information. He's also an author. Uh, he wrote uh, America's Engineered Decline for the John Birch Society. It's an excellent book. I've read it myself. And I wanted to get him on when he talked about the cowardice of drones. I saw an article he wrote last week and how it's converting everything over uh, to these faceless killers and it's pure dehumanization. You know, people are worried about uh, you know, uh, unions taking their jobs or vice versa. And we're all taught to compete with each other. What about computers, robots, war making? Because this is where everything's going. It won't be humans under the sea. They're now admitting for decades they've had robot uh, uh, vessels on the water and under the water, submarines, in space, in the air, and on the ground. And these can follow the orders of a tiny technocratic elite. Notice the banksters that have hijacked Europe through insider crony fraud and, and, and monopoly uh, scams. They call themselves technocrats. So this is the big issue. I, I, we'll get to that at the bottom of the hour, but I want to cover some other issues because we started seeking to get Mr. Gregg on last week. The shooting hadn't happened Sunday. And I noticed for LewRockwell.com uh, and for his own side, he wrote an excellent article about how the Sikhs are constantly getting shot, beat up, uh, beat up by police because people see the bright turban. Most Muslims don't actually wear that. And by the way, Sikhs are not Muslims. They tend to get a lot of fights with Muslims over in India. But the point is, is that it's a different group completely. Uh, but people see the beard. They see the, uh, you know, religious uh, headgear and it's over. They die. Uh, and uh, those famous cases of cops beating the daylights out of them for no reason. Just because they just, you know, you see somebody with the striking beard and the, and the bright turban, it's, it's clobbering time. Uh, and so he wrote an article about that. But I have to say this. In the aftermath of the shooting, I'll ask him a hard question and put him on the spot right out of the gates here. If we have criminal elements of our government, and anybody can just type in secret testing on U.S. troops, lethal testing on U.S. troops, lethal testing on foster children, irradiation of foster children. Thousands of U.S. foster children, the Department of Energy admits, were radiated to death in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, 110,000 Israeli children were radiated, many of them to death, and the ringworm children. Department of Energy paid Israel to kill their own people. And that's on Israeli TV. Just type it into YouTube. You'll see the TV shows about it. I mean, we're talking about frying kids' brains. Uh, the ones that were lucky died right away. Some are still alive today, mentally retarded, no hair, you know, 50 years old. This is the type of stuff that goes on. And so if they would do that, shoot black men up with syphilis, uh, you know, all the rest of it. Uh, the UN's been caught giving foster children just last year, live polio. It was all on purpose, folks. And that's just a minor footnote. All oh, 67,000 kids got paralyzed. It's no big deal. 2011 UN program. Why wouldn't they stage a shooting? I mean, if they stage Fast and Furious and ship guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment, that killed thousands conservatively in Mexico, hundreds here in the U.S., including three police officers, one of them a Border Patrol. Some say six. We can prove three. I mean, I mean, I mean, we all know Oklahoma City had government fingerprints, the very same crew that's in power today. So I'm going to bring that up to you and, and, and then just get into the shooting itself. Look at how they're hyping it. Look at all the draconian gun bills they've got right now. Look at how the guy was in Army psychological operations and then suddenly becomes a white supremacist, just like Elohim City and just how the feds ran that in 95. So there's the big uh, question for uh, William Gregg. Will, good to have you here uh, with us on the show. Am I out of line if governments have been caught staging events like Gulf of Tonkin, Ajax, Gladio, our own government, am I out of line with the opportune timing of this and the witnesses saying they saw four men with guns shooting people and the head of the Sikh community, the president of the group, saying there were men casing the joint before? I mean, or should I just believe one guy who happens to be dead, he did it and he's an evil, uh, evil white guy, so now we need the war on terror uh, to be shifted onto conservative white guys? Alex, I think what you're describing is well within the compass of the official cynicism of the government that presumes to rule us. It's a question of ability and not disposition when you're talking about a hypothetical scenario involving state shootings or atrocities of this kind, because as you correctly point out, there have been many instances of false flag terrorist attacks and similar atrocities that have been perpetrated in the past for reasons of tuning the public atmosphere for a proposed policy change that requires the dislocation of comfortable assumptions, the sudden violent shock that can create a new concern. 
offensive. And to that list that you mentioned of these horrible experiments involving the infection of people with various diseases or other types of assaults on the persons, you can add what happened in Guatemala just after World War II. There was a eugenesis program that just became a matter of public record just a couple of years ago. And it's no secret that this technocratic elite that you describe exercises what it considers to be a proprietary claim on the rest of us. They consider us to be their subjects, not only in terms of what we generate, what we earn through our exertions in our industry, but also with respect to our physical person, which explains, among other things, the Obamacare monstrosity. They really don't recognize any limit to the power that they presume to exercise over any of us. So when you're dealing with somebody who comes from the background that Mr. Page apparently did, and he has an instant of this sort that has an uncomfortable congruence to the scenarios that have been pitched by the DHS for a number of years, actually going back before the Obama administration into the Clinton administration, you saw scenarios of this kind being peddled by what was then sort of the INCOA Department of Homeland Security, the FBI in particular, with its Project Megado report in 1999-2000. They've been tuning the atmosphere for the better part of two decades now to anticipate this advent of so-called lone wolf terrorism that would implicate the social cohort they call the radical right. So when things like this happen, and once again, you have to take into account what the FBI has been doing for the last 10 years in terms of staging little melodramas, homeland security theater, false flag terrorist plots involving Muslims, in which you have people that the federal government refers to as terrorism facilitators. That's actually in the legal documents that refer to certain people employed by the FBI as terrorism facilitators. We have instance after instance in which the Muslims have been manipulated this way. It shouldn't surprise us at all if we find out that at least some of these episodes, some of these incidents, bear the same fingerprints and have been orchestrated for the same purposes, particularly, as you point out, in light of the drive, the accelerating drive for civilian disarmament. Exactly. They've staged stuff before. They uh, stand to gain from it. It has all the telltale signs. We would be naive to not look at this as being at least provocateur, and the evidence, I, I believe, points towards completely staged with the timing and all the rest of it, with the Southern Poverty Law Center fluttering around. Sure, and the television ad that was playing on Sunday, capitalizing on what had happened in Aurora and then what had happened in Tucson back in 2011. Once again, I talk about the idea that there's a certain harmony, a certain convergence of events here that drive us in a certain direction. And there are people who do, to the best of their ability, and their ability, I think, is rather formidable, try to script large-scale events of this sort or to capitalize on things that happen that are compatible with their agenda. If you're dealing in the person of Mr. Page with somebody who simply went off on a bender after being trained to kill people. He's a disgruntled former federal employee. That's his most important affiliation here. Everything else is speculative. We do know that this guy, like Timothy McVeigh, like the other people who surrounded McVeigh, the others unknown, who've conveniently been ushered off the stage, uh, these people were federal employees or former federal employees. Uh, take the uh, Joker killer. Uh, all federal grants, special yeah. Air Force psychiatrist assigned just to him. Uh, people reporting multiple shooters, but that doesn't mean, again, it's always people on government payroll or PSYOP chiefs or sheep dipped uh, Pentagon folks like McVeigh that do this. Or in the case of the accused or a shooter, once again, you got the connection to DARPA, which is very much the past masters of manipulating both technology and psychology. To bring about certain exactly it's uh, always the same mo complex yeah it's always the same mo it's always the same timing uh that said then shifting away from that bottom line giving our liberties up isn't going to protect us from nuts the answer is more guns uh, to protect ourselves and that's how the american people are responding we're about to go to break but will where would you say the state of the new world order is right now are things going well for them or badly I think in terms of what they achieve or what they seek to achieve with respect to the consolidation of financial and political power and also military power, things are going very well for them as they go increasingly poorly for us. We live in a relationship of inversion with the people who presume to rule us. They're, when you're talking about particularly the financial element of this elite, they're giddily buying up most of the 
afflicted farmland in the United States positioning themselves to act in the same way that the much denigrated preppers and survivalists behave. The difference is they're able to do it with entire uh, huge tracts of farmland as opposed to having food storage. They can simply buy the farms. And the same thing is happening in South America. They've been behaving this way since 2008. Many of the people who, for public consumption, the sale preppers and survivalists, the people in, in hedge funds and such like, are doing the same thing on a massive, monumentally larger scale. That's something that is to their advantage. It's to their advantage that they're able to manipulate public opinion through the use of events of this sort, whether staged or incidental. And, of course, it's to their advantage that we have wars and rumors of wars uh, propagating overseas. War, of course, is something that's very conducive to molding the public mind into a fashion where people are receptive to the idea of surrendering their liberties and surrendering their individuality in the service of something supposedly larger than themselves. So as things go poorly for us, and increasingly poorly, things go increasingly better for our self-appointed rulers. That's, That's right. Killing is, killing is their business. Business is good. Alex Jones here with a message to fellow freedom lovers. The prognosis for the entire planetary economic system runs from bad to worse. The globalist model is to shut down societies and starve patriots out until they acquiesce to the global takeover. That's why we've assembled the most vital and important preparedness items at InfoWarsShop.com. These are items that I did research on, that I personally use. You've got the life straw, so you can turn fetid water into safe water anywhere you go. The KTOR hand crank generator to charge up key equipment during power outages or out in the field. Strategic relocation, third edition by Joel Skousen. When disaster strikes by Matthew Stein. Therosafe, used by Homeland Security to protect yourself during any radiological event. Hand crank shortwave AM FM radios. Everything that we've researched and found to be the best is available at InfoWarsShop.com. And your purchase makes our InfoWar possible. We're getting prepared. Are you? InfoWarsShop.com. William Gregg is our guest. He writes for LewRockwell.com. New American Magazine. And, of course, we also post his fine work at InfoWars.com. You can find his books and videos that are extremely powerful, like Global Gun Grab. He's, <laughs> he's got that on the whole gun grab at his website, WillGreg.com. Going back in the short segment we have, next long segment, we're going to get into drones and, well, really the end, the end of humanity. That's what Bill Joy, 12 years ago, called it in Wired Magazine. He called it uh, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. We're going to be breaking that down. But I noticed you wrote a story, uh, I guess it was yesterday, uh, breaking down the fact that Sikhs, and up front Sunday, I said this could have been some lunatic because there's such, you know, Islamophobia where people I talk to think Muslims, you know, every Muslim wants to kill you out there while Western governments bring them in at record numbers to create that clash of civilizations. It's all a divide and conquer uh, mechanism, but the fact that the Sikhs, uh, you know, are wearing that archetypal dress that almost no Muslims wear, uh, because it is a Central Asian dress, you know, really a medieval dress, uh, and when cops or anybody sees these, it, it, it's, it's almost like a bass fish seeing a big lure go through the water. They just go crazy, uh, and uh, you broke down some cases of the, the amazing abuse the Sikhs have uh, put up with. The one case that I thought was so striking happened in Joliet, Illinois, Illinois, forgive me, about five years ago, March 11th of 2007. There's a fellow, and I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce his name, who is a Gulf War veteran. His name is Kuldeep Singh Nag. He had served in the first Gulf War. He had a bronze star for serving in the military. And for some reason, over the couple of years that he lived in this residential neighborhood there in Illinois, uh, Mr. Dag and his family had attracted the ire of some of their neighbors who quite possibly were acting on the perception that they were dealing with interlopers from the Arab world. They had incidents of vandalism where their garage was defaced and a couple of times somebody fired a BB gun into their property. At some point in early 2007, somebody filed an anonymous complaint that Mr. Nag had an inoperable van on his property. And under a municipal ordinance there in Joliet, apparently it was required that he register this vehicle in spite of the fact that it was inoperable and on his own property. So in the morning of March 11th, a police officer showed up. A police officer's name was Ben Grant, 
who knocked on the door and announced that he was going to tow away the van. And this is the first time that the Nag family had been informed that there was a problem. According to the municipal ordinance, they should have received a one, at least one notice, but they never did, that they needed to register the van. And so Mr. Nag got upset. Within a few seconds, he was being beaten by Officer Grant. And out of Mr. Grant's tax fattened mouth came the familiar strain of profanities. You blank, blank Arab, get out of my country or I'm going to kill you. As he beat this man with a baton and threw him face down and handcuffed him and called in a report that he had been assaulted by Mr. Nag. And he was eventually convicted of aggravated assault. And his assault consisted of desperately throwing his arms up to try to ward off these completely unprovoked blows by a police baton. Apparently, impeding the cranium-bound trajectory of a police baton constitutes aggravated assault. No, no, courts have uh, ruled that. So yeah. you're going to let somebody attack you with a deadly weapon for no reason. Exactly. See, I wouldn't be able to control myself. I'm not, uh, I, I just can't handle the the, uh, the the image of these bullies when somebody's down, kicking them in the face, and if you cover your face, they charge you. It is just, it's just an incredible crime. Yeah, for instance, I've seen people literally be charged with assaulting an officer for bleeding on the fists that are beating them. And that's part of what I call the martial law mindset, the idea that we have an unqualified duty to render immediate, unconditional submission to anybody in a government-issued costume who orders us to do something. In a free society that's worthy of that description, nobody who's a government employee would be able to exercise that supposed authority over... Well, let's be better. honest. They're getting rid of the private property and the free speech next. There's really nothing left but the Second Amendment. We're not a free country anymore. We've been conquered by criminal elements, and they've trained and hyped up the system to to love evil. That's apparently what's happening. I can't disagree with that assessment as much as it pains me to admit it. I do think that one of the reasons we're seeing such a drive right now to promote civilian disarmament is the idea that within a couple of years, the powers that be are going to be dealing with Full Spectrum Operations in the Homeland, which is the name of an essay from Small Wars Journal that just came out within the last couple of weeks. Yeah, let's pull that up. In fact, I saw that. Give us that title again. Full, full yeah. Spectrum Operations in the Homeland, a vision of the future. It's in the Small Wars, Small Wars Journal. All right, we have done countless reports on this. We have had many guests on breaking it down, but now it's here. About 12 years ago, I began to read public Pentagon documents where they said there won't be any astronauts, there won't be any submariners, there won't be anybody on ships unless it's in repair. There won't be any submarines, as I said. There won't be any men in aircraft, or women for that matter. We're all fighting women in, in, you know, in the Air Force, you know, women in combat roles. It's all a done issue. It's all over. The globalists who think of us as animals, that think of us as, as, as human resources to be used, they have made the decision to get humans out of all the decision-making processes. When they made workers work more than 18 hours a day with almost no pay, working their fingers to the bloody bone because Al Gore is so greedy at Apple that they had the worst working conditions basically in China because he's you know on the board making the decisions because he's so liberal, so trendy, and so loving, and so good. When that happened, they said, you know what, instead of putting up suicide nets, Get rid of the people, bring in robots. And the and it's one thing if a corporation replaces humans with robots and then have robots making the robots, which they advertise on television. Uh, and these big corporations are bragging that soon there'll be no humans involved anywhere from mining the material all the way to delivering the product. Google cars are getting authorized for the road, all of it. But here's the problem. They're already saying that the cars are safer than humans and so that humans won't be allowed to drive soon. They're already designing the cars with cameras hooked into the police that watch you because a child might get left in the car and die, so the police have to watch you. They're already admitting your laptop is watching you. It's beyond 1984, and so humans are allowing the technological controllers, the technocrats as they call themselves, to take our tax money and our inventions and our ingenuity and wall us out of society. And that's why Bill Joy, back in 2000, what was it, the April issue of Wired Magazine, wrote, 
why the future doesn't need us. You can pull it up, it's online. And he said, yeah, I recently went and had dinner with 200 you know, company owners. He was the owner of Sun Microsystems. And we had a debate. Do we kill everybody or do we allow some to live, but just let them play games online? And basically, basically, it's like the people you see in Wally that are on the big uh, you know, cruise ship and, and, and can't walk without the aid of robots. There's either that future. This is what the elite are saying, or they call themselves the elite, the, the, the alpha predators. There's either that future where we're these waddling creatures or there's just get rid of us all. And Dick Cheney wrote in the September 20th, 2000 document, he just said, create race-specific bioweapons and we'll start wiping out certain races of people. And he said, we need to have the media legitimize its use. Only one newspaper wrote an article saying it was bad. Strangely enough, it was the Austin American Statesman. That's a terrible globalist publication. But maybe that even got to them. So he, here's the deal, folks. I'm not worried if my hair is falling out. I'm not worried if uh, I got a blemish on my nose. Uh, I'm not worried what my neighbors think about me. Most people are caught and paralyzed in this trendiness where it's, it's, it's just all about their own ego. Folks, we've got eugenicists, neo-feudal fascists who are anti-free market, anti-family, who, by the way, happen to be a cultist on top of it. I didn't even cover that issue 17 years ago, but the research kept running into that, who are basically megalomaniacs. You heard about Nero, Stalin, Hitler, Montezuma. You know crazy people get in and do horrible things. Now they are announcing, oh, we guess what? We did have space planes that were robot in space. Oh, guess what? The Air Force will completely convert to drones. Oh, guess what? We are going to have the entire submarine fleet be robot. Oh, guess what? We're do have combat robots. We didn't want to show them to you because they're scary looking, but have you seen Terminator? See, things like Terminator, that's not life imitating art now with Skynet. That's art imitating life. When you read about the Matrix, and I'm not saying they'll ever be able to do all this. This is what they're theorizing. There's a DARPA document from 1978. Or is it 76? I'm going from memory. It's in my book. It's out of print. It's sent to tyranny, but it's online at prisonplanet.tv. Then we're going to our guest. This is some background knowledge here. Problem is, I can't start talking about this and then shut up. We're going to go to him. And I apologize that I'm ranting. And they say in there, well, we'll just, for everyone's safety, we'll just wire into everybody's brain, give them unlimited pleasure, give them a virtual reality to live in, and as moral as long as they're not in pain, and we'll put you in a tank and the heat from your own body will be used to power the electronics. You may have seen that in a 1999 film called The Matrix. Yeah, that movie didn't think of any of that. This is what DARPA is thinking of. And by the way, they implement most of what they end up really pushing for. They, our society is a DARPA world. Let's uh, go back to author, researcher, filmmaker, Will Gregg, willgregg.com. Greg is G-R-I-G-G.com. Excellent site. Recommend folks check that out. Uh, Will, uh, you've heard my little five-minute rant here. Uh, they're now making the announcement, and you've written some excellent articles breaking down how sexy it is. They're getting, they're getting you know, battle stars uh, for, for sitting there in their air conditioning, and, and it's manly to kill a couple hundred people if you get one guy, no judge, no jury, it's always, of course, violates the Geneva Convention, our own rules. But now they're saying the drones will be here. And you were getting into that document, uh, full spectrum dominance here in Und Homeland. Yes, full spectrum operations in the homeland, a vision of the future. And when they're talking about full spectrum, of course, that entails the use of all the technology that's been deployed in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen and points unknown, including the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones that would be used to conduct surveillance and also to conduct kill missions. And we already have two precedents, at least two, there are probably more, but two very important ones involving the summary execution of U.S. citizens on presidential orders by way of a drone-fired missile. The first was Anwar al-Awlaki, who was accused but never formally charged with various crimes of subversion and sedition and such like. He was executed by a drone-fired missile in the country of Yemen on the specific explicit orders of Barack Obama.
Obama, who told his underlings, I want Anwar al -Awlaki. And then a couple And by weeks, the way, they say that to make it sound like he's James Bond. We don't even know if any of that's true, and his family got killed reportedly, because Fox News did report he was really meeting with the Secretary of the Army when he was on the most wanted list and was a high-level uh, agent. So that was probably just them publicly retiring one of their uh, assets. And they may have actually killed him. They're so traitorous to their own operatives. That's true. I mean, we have to consider, once again, the inexhaustible cynicism of the people we're dealing with. But we do know that a couple of weeks later, there was another drone strike on the 16-year-old son of Mr. al who had apparently gone to Yemen searching for his father, who had been publicly named as somebody on a kill list. So they've, they've established a precedent here by making the claim and exercising the supposed authority to bring about the summary execution of U.S. citizens by way of drone-fired missiles. And, of course, this year we see that surveillance drones for domestic law enforcement applications are becoming a more and more commonplace thing. They've been in the pipeline, as you point out, Alex, for many years. There have been a couple of instances where there have been sheriff's departments who have publicly denied that they have received Homeland Security grants or Pentagon grants to obtain drones. But they have nonetheless obtained them. There was a leak a couple of months ago describing the FAA's licensing permits for the operation of domestic drones in various places in the United States. A number of people were surprised to find out that their local police department, the local sheriff's department, has been put on that list. And they're getting prepared now to upgrade their services to include these devices. And we have just last week a court ruling authorizing or vindicating after the fact the use of two drones operated by the Department of Homeland Security to help conduct the arrest of the sons of a farmer by the name of Brossard in North Dakota. He'd been arrested the day before by the local sheriff's office, with whom he'd had some trouble over the course of a number of years. There's troubled sheriff's department here. Mr. Brossard and his family are farmers <coughs> that had disputes with their neighbors, and in this particular instance, they were involved in dispute over wandering cattle. They're Which the media spun as rustling, and so now the sheriff's department yeah. called in Homeland Security and the Air Force with air support, and that's what they're now announcing. I've talked to police, but it's also in the documents. You mentioned that full-spectrum dominance yeah. uh, report. I was just showing it on screen for PrisonPlanet.tv viewers. It's got Army entering our houses. It covers everything they're going to do to us. Exactly. Uh, the loving gun confiscation, everything. Go ahead. Well, all these things have been done overseas by the U.S. military in the course of what is called Operations Other Than War, double O-T-W, O-2, Operations Other Than War, in which you have police officers acting as reservists and National Guard operatives, National Guard soldiers, sent overseas as part of military operations where they behave as police officers in countries such as Afghanistan or Haiti, Somalia, you know the list. And then once they've developed this ability... They come back and they start doing the same things domestically. One of the things that I find quite fascinating is that if you take a look at military deployments in the 1990s during the first Bush administration and during the Clinton administration, you have episodes of what is called in the literature micro-disarmament. Micro-disarmament is, as you say, Alex, the confiscation of firearms using gun registry lists. This happened in Haiti, for instance. In Haiti, you could own just about any firearm or explosive device you wanted, as long as you registered with the local constabulary. Once the name and the firearms or explosives were in the registry, the United States military, which invaded in, I believe, 1994, if memory serves, in order to reinstall Aristide, who was a not particularly desirable ruler, had been thrown out of the country by a military junta, acting on the supposed authority of the U.N. Security Council resolution, the U.S. military invaded Haiti, and reinstalled Aristide at Bayonet Point, and part of this involved disarming anybody who could put up a fuss to fight back against this fellow, a deranged Marxist ruler. And so they went door to door collecting firearms using gun registration lists. This is called micro disarmament, as are gun buybacks and turn in programs. We have those happening all throughout the United States every single year. And they have gun buyback to create the news images of people lined up turning guns in to create the perception that guns are bad. They're the police exactly. to, 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 to acclimate. But again, as you just pointed out, the U.S. military are masters of gun disarmament of the general public, as they call it, micro disarmament. And the new U.N. treaty, you made a film on this breaks down in Article 15, they're right there saying that states will aid other states and the UN in micro-disarmament, and they admit that that's their plan. 
I mean, it's just incredible that we're this far down the line and now they want to use the drones. You know, uh, please continue, but I want to get back into the drones. Are you, All right. I mean, I mean, do you see you know, the same path that I see us going down where the system is now going to autonomous drones where it's not even these heroes in the air conditioning killing people uh, uh, to where the technocrats literally have armies of their own uh, combat mechs? This is in the literature, you point out. They aspire to do this. Whether their ability will match their aspirations, I can't tell you, but they certainly have envisioned a scenario in which you'd have this Skynet type of vertically integrated and thoroughly mechanized system or to use the Battlestar Galactica idiom that'd be a little bit like the Cylons, where you have fully mechanized and independently, autonomously functioning uh, uh, mechanisms of death that are involved in routine uh, punitive strikes and which carry out programs intended to spare the exposure of military personnel to the dangers that would be involved in actually carrying out these missions. I mean, obviously, cyber war, that's long distance war involving drone strikes right now is a generous step along that direction. And I want to make a point here that really the most dangerous drone is the one that is operating the joystick and not the one operated by the joystick. The drone means the human drone. You sits in one of these air-conditioned uh, air conditioned uh, offices in Nevada or Virginia. Yeah, you quoted some them. of them from the New York Times where they were just like, I do not think about who I'm killing. I do what... I am told they are bad. They are converting this. It's the exact same nomenclature against us. Exactly. The idea of full spectrum dominance means that there is literally no security that one can find against the aspirations of those who want to assert the dominance. We're completely deprived of any means of resisting anything that our masters want to inflict upon us. And that's a, a term of art that started to come into the literature about 15 or 16 years ago. Now they're talking about it not only in terms of operations other than the war overseas, but here domestically. Obviously, if you have a situation where these things are being carried out by, by soulless machines operated by people who surrendered their souls, who are inaccessible, then by definition they are invulnerable. They're completely beyond any kind of retaliatory action. That's the type of the system that they really want to create. And that's what full-spectrum dominance is, so then we have to look at the ruling controllers and what's their mindset absolutely vicious, arrogant scum who hate the family, who hate God. I mean, when you study the globalists, these are absolute power-mad materialists like Marx or Lenin or Engels. Uh, do you agree with that statement? I don't think that that's an exaggeration. They might not necessarily be doctrinally committed to the teachings of Marx or, or Engels, but they certainly behave in a Leninist fashion. Vladimir Lenin defined his philosophy of government as power without limit resting directly on force and absolutely unimpeded by laws. And whether you're talking about people who've studied the Marxist economic gibberish in terms of the way that they organize power and exercise it, they're definitely Leninist in practice. And that's not something that's confined to one or the other of the two branches of the incumbent party that we defied artificially to Republicans and Democrats. This is something that is shared pretty much by the entire ruling elite, not only politically, but academically and economically and so forth. I think it's worthwhile to point out that the aggressive dehumanization of those targeted by this system is something that has made, if you will, robots out of the people who are operating the joysticks. I referred in an earlier article to a document that came out in 2002 in anticipation of the second Gulf War. There was a computer program called Bug Splat, which referred to incidental casualties of civilians in a targeted area. And it was an algorithm that was supposed to calculate the number, or at least the percentage of people who would be wiped out of for instance, a 5,000-pound bomb were lobbed into a residential neighborhood in Baghdad, and they calculated an acceptable percentage of bug splat in a given operation. Now, Tommy Franks, who reviewed this, signed off on all 22 of these operations that involved a high level of what was called bug splat. And to that idiom was added another expression, squirters, which referred to people who were observed through the surveillance technology of these drones who were injured or wounded or trying to flee. William Gregg is our guest here. We're going to get to your phone calls and a bunch of other news. <laughs> Geithner and new scandals. We've got Petraeus lined up to be VP. You know, that's what last year Steve Pachenik said. Talk about a big insider. we got to get Dr. Pachenik back on the show. Um, but Obama is leaking. They're looking at Petraeus uh, to be the uh, VP with... 
uh, Romney. So we're going to be uh, discussing that coming up as well. He sounds like a great guy for president. I mean, he laughs at the CIA, spies on us illegally th through our appliances in public, admits to felonies. So why not have the general slash CIA director as the vice president? There's just no end to this. And it's all how they're patriots. No, they're getting rid of our old republic, okay? Because it isn't compatible with their scientific tyranny. And humans have to take control of our development. We have to decide that we're decision makers and that we understand what's happening <coughs> in the architecture in our society. We cannot just go quietly into the night because these globalists are eugenicists. You know, you make the point that we're being turned into these biological androids, and you're absolutely right. Why do you need to have combat robots? Well, you can just brainwash people with sleep deprivation and a feeling of elite spree de corps after they've gone through that ritual to then be willing to do anything to not buck the peer pressure uh, and to go out and wage war against your own people. I mean, if folks think we're decadent now, Will, where do you see us going in the future? I think it's important to recognize that everything they do in terms of refining the machinery of oppression here is designed to bring about changes in us, assuming that there will be some of us who will be privileged to remain rather than being summarily liquidated. And I think that the people who presume to rule us want to keep at least enough of us around in order to provide the raw material upon which they will subsist. And so the takers, the parasites, can't outright kill the hosts, you know, the people who are productive. And I think that the most ominous changes we're talking about here don't have to do necessarily with the technology involved. Once again, it has to do with what goes on between the ears of the people who are part of this system. And the militarization of the mindset of law enforcement specifically is something that I find quite remarkable. This is what's been going on now for about 40 years when the U.S. government decided to start declaring war on the possession of the use of narcotics or to declare war on terrorism, as happened just a decade or so ago. When the government puts itself on a war footing domestically, obviously it's talking about creating a battle zone out of the United States. And that's an expression we find in this article from Small Wars Journal. The battle zone would be domestic. And this is, once again, not a new development. In this book I, I wrote that you mentioned, Global Gun Grab, there's a chapter in here called Militarizing Mayberry that talks about the way that law enforcement and the military have been blended and conjoined. And you have the Pentagon supplying material, arms, and all kinds of training to every police department of any significant size in the country. I live across the Snake River from a little town called Ontario, Oregon. It's about 12,000 people. They have a SWAT team that trains here in Idaho with people who are from the Special Forces, uh, teach them how to militarize every encounter between law enforcement and civilians. And we shouldn't be called civilians, by the way. The police or the, the peace officers should be civilians as well. In Aurora, Colorado, a few weeks before the shooting, there was a bank robbery where the police simply shut down an entire block and arrested everybody in sight, creating, if you will, sort of a microcosmic martial law setting. They arrested everybody so they could search their cars. They handcuffed them, and then they asked permission to search their cars if somebody handcuffed who could, could resist that, that offer. And then in Colorado Springs, which is just a few miles away, it might be a couple of dozen miles away from Aurora, you have police wearing SWAT regalia as they're carrying out their routine duties. They, if you're stopped for a speeding and Yeah, that place is a beta test. That's why they yeah. staged it there. It's under they're their control. Yeah, they, they, they did it. The, the whole deal. They're a bunch of terrorists. Final segment with William Gregg. Very insightful uh, interview today. And then we're going to come back from break, go to your phone calls, and then get into all the other news I haven't covered. And boy, that's a lot. Here on this Tuesday, worldwide transmission. Will, I've been asking the questions here. In the five minutes we've got left uh, on your considerable plate, what else is front and center? What else would you like to impart to our worldwide audience of freedom lovers? I think it's worth reviewing our assumptions about how a society should provide for security if we're going to have a free and, and reasonably prosperous society, security has to be something for which the individual takes responsibility. And we have to start uprooting some of the bad assumptions that have been embedded in the system of politics under which we live. And the first is that the government should have a monopoly on the use of force. Say what you will about the Constitutional Republic we were given. 
one of the really interesting things that distinguishes it from any other system of government is that it explicitly repudiated the idea that government should have a monopoly on the use of force. That's what the Second Amendment is about. People get into arguments about the minutia of the Second Amendment or the applications thereof. What they don't recognize is that by explicitly recognizing the individual right to armed self-defense, that document repudiates the idea that government has a monopoly on the use of force. Yet every political science class in this country is going to teach that concept, and that's a Leninist concept, not a Madisonian one. If the government doesn't have a monopoly on the use of force, it stands to reason that the government cannot use force that the individual is forbidden to use, and that leads us to the non-aggression principle. I have no right to commit aggression against anybody else, and I have, of course, the reciprocal right not to expect to be aggressed against. And it doesn't matter whether the aggression is committed by some tattooed gangbanger who's part of a private mob or some tattooed gangbanger who wears a government-issued costume. If it's aggressive violence, it's wrong. And I would hope that what's happening in places like public in California, where there's serious consideration being given out to disbanding a police department that is murderous, I would hope that that would start to propagate itself across the country. I've helped in some very, very small way to bring about the disbanding of a couple of police departments. There's one in Covington, Texas, that was being run by a police chief who was the local drug lord. That's certainly not an uncommon thing, owing to what goes on in the name of the war on drugs. And what's happening is the pressures of the financial collapse are becoming more acute, is that a lot of municipalities are learning that they can't afford to spend the money that's been set aside in these unfunded pensions for police chiefs who can pull down $200,000 after working for 18 months. This was I saw a police chief in a small town in California getting like 700 Gs a year. Yeah, that's not uncommon. And what's going on <laughs> in places like Stockton or North Las Vegas, where 67% of their budget is on so-called public safety and public security, you have these unionized police forces that are... Well, that's it. I mean, we're being held hostage by the security bureaucracy. That happens in every other third world country. Yes. And, and they're and going to kill exactly. the golden goose if this doesn't get reversed. Yeah, and it's, it's, there's getting to be some pushback here, which is why I think we're hearing discussions of the idea of full-spectrum operations in the homeland. And this scenario sketched out in the Small Wars Journal talks about a small town in South Carolina becoming an American Fallujah where you'd have to have the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon essentially turn the town into a free fire zone if people don't submit to what this document calls the constitutional legitimacy of the federal government. And that, once again, assumes that the government is somehow the source of its own legitimacy. All right, William, let me stop you. I hadn't read the whole document. I saw it a few weeks ago, I think, because you'd written about it. Excuse me? I mean, you're a respected journalist for the New American Magazine for, I don't know, decades. I hadn't read that. You're saying that full spectrum dominance in the Homeland document talks about occupying and taking out American citizens in a city. In a city, in a small city called Darlington, South Carolina. That's Tell you what, pull that up. Can you do five more minutes on the other side? Yes, I can. All right, pull that up. I want to break this here on the air when we come back. We're continuing to talk with New American Magazine writer, filmmaker, author. He also writes for Lou Rockwell, lourockwell.com. I'm Alex Jones with Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. And constantly new Army documents are put out public on the Army's own website. Re-education camps for the American people, national gun confiscation drills, uh, demonization on the founding fathers, veterans. They teach the military this now. Uh, just, just incredible treason now that foreign banks have bragged on national television and in print that they've captured us and are now gonna mop up the freedoms we had. Private property, all of it, it's, it's gone if they have their way. And uh, we were about to let uh, Will Gregg go and he started bringing up this full spectrum dominance in the Homeland Pentagon document that we found. And I found uh, uh, you know, uh, sites that write about the Pentagon and we'll put one of them up here, Small Wars Journal, has quotes out of the full compendium where it talks about uh, areas of South Carolina, and we're going to go over this, it says uh, a Tea Party group takes over the town, so the military takes over radio, TV, water, and energy. I've told you they'll always do that. Uh, they turn that off till the town submits, and they call it reinstalling the elected government. They mean those that are engaged in election fraud. And this is what the John Warner Defense Authorization Act dealt with, was taking over legislatures. Remember what they said last year when Texas 
unanimously in the House said, no more groping, no more grabbing our genitals inside the pants. We're going to enforce existing laws. The Fed said, we're preparing an F-16 air embargo. No aircraft will be allowed to enter the state or take off. How's it F-16 enforce that? They're going to blow them out of the sky. And we had troops on the show in Oklahoma and other states confirmed it. They were getting ready to put the tanks on trains to invade Austin. They were going to roll down Mopac, you know, the big, uh, big uh, railroad right out of Oklahoma, right into Austin, right to the capital with tanks. And, and that was on the news, too, that they were going to blow airliners out of the air with F-16s, with sidewinders, AIM-9s. And if you don't remember that, look it up. I'm not joking about that. They said, we will have a military embargo of Texas. So this is the plan. Foreign banks have taken over. Uh, and what's incredible... Will Gregg, is that the re-education camps, the gun confiscation, the emergency centers establishment act, it's all there, but they'll have the media simultaneously have the, have the Southern Poverty Law Center, ADL, come out and say, we're crazy, there's no world government, when I can pick up Time Magazine, Newsweek, Financial Times, The Economist, where they're announcing bankers took us over, they're unelected, they're installing leaders in Europe, isn't it great that we're slaves now? I mean, I can play clips of the news saying we're slaves to world government run by banks, and then the guests all say it's good. I can play that right now, but the ADL says it doesn't exist. What's going on here? What's going on is that they're pursuing sort of the Soviet approach of demonizing the people who say something rather than attacking what is said or showing the weaknesses of what is said about an event that is documentable. It's a question of motive and one's collective associations that is the most important consideration, according to people like the ADL and the SPLC. The line that they feed the public is that the conspiracy theorists are plotting to take over, and they apparently don't understand the irony of that position. But with respect to this particular document that we're talking about here, what they're describing is a full-spectrum military operation targeting Darlington and South Carolina. The scenario they paint is that in 2016, the depression is deepened, people are getting restive. There is a so-called civic down in South Carolina, which is considered to be a strategically critical choke point because it stands athwart an important uh, east-to-west thoroughfare running across the United States. I think it's I-95. So on the basis of the strategic, the strategic significance of this city within the battle zone that is the United States, there has to be a coordinated effort involving the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon and federalized National Guard troops to go in and put down this insurrection. Their objective is to do this by overawing people by this conspicuous display of force, sort of the same thing that happened with the Whiskey Rebellion in the early years of the Republic. But the fact that they're calling this full-spectrum dominance, and in light of what is said in the other documents that we have read regarding the way that military operations are conducted in environments other than war, operations other than war, it's pretty clear that what you're talking about is that behind this display of force would be the exercise of real force to dispatch people who are, con who are considered to be uh, ineducable. People who are not sufficiently intimidated by the display of force would be, would be dealt with as severely, perhaps, as we saw in Volusia when they simply turned that town into a free fire zone. Well, that's what they're doing drills for. I've been to countless urban warfare drills where they admit they're practicing taking on, quote, the militia. And we've got all these army training manuals. And the point is, this has been on the books a while, but they're they're gearing up. They're massively increasing funding. They're massively increasing the drills. Uh, and, and I just can't believe it's actually coming uh, to this. Have you seen all the news articles and all the, the TV shows where they're bragging that we've now been captured by foreign bankers? I've seen some shows that convey that message, and there's very little effort to disguise what's going on, and it should be obvious to anybody with even a passing acquaintance with the connections of people like Timothy Geithner and, and Paulson and the rest of the people who were involved in the October Revolution of 2008 when the entire United States economy was turned over a lock, stock, and barrel to the investment banking community as it styles itself. It's pretty obvious that's what's happened. And, of course, you may mention the fact that you've got the international banking community, as it styles itself once again, appointing political officials in, in uh, European governments, governments throughout the Eurozone. And you have towns in this country that are being browbeaten into a similar relationship with the banking interests here in this country. 
And it stands to reason that someplace like a Darlington, South Carolina, or some other bankrupt municipality would give rise to the type of healthy insurrection that's described in this article, and the approach of the Pentagon would be to snuff it out, to snuff it out using whatever means would be necessary. And toward the end of this document, there's a perfectly deranged line here that is really, I think, a poker tell. We cannot discount the agility of an external threat, the evolution of al-Qaeda, for example, and its ability to take advantage of a Darlington event within U.S. borders. Well, there it is. The militias would be the natural handmaidens of al-Qaeda, whatever that title Yeah, yeah, let's stop about. right there. I've seen them pushing this. That, that's what I've said. And boy, you just, uh, here's another document saying it. The militia, the anti-New World Order folks, who pretty much disappeared after 9-11 because, you know, they, 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 you know, they hate, quote, Islam so much, many of them. This is, this is so insane and just a complete and total joke. Uh, to say that Al-Qaeda would link up with militias. I mean, imagine how gun-owning libertarian conservatives are going to work with Al-Qaeda. Meanwhile, our own military brought in to Libya out of um, Egypt, but also out of uh, the Mediterranean, landing them in Tripoli, tens of thousands of real Al-Qaeda who are now exporting high-tech weapons out of Libya they captured into Syria. Yeah. And our own criminal government, how do they do that? Because there's now even articles, I saw another one uh, today. I mean, there's mainstream articles praising Al-Qaeda and what a great job they're doing in Syria. I mean, this, I mean, this is like an Alice in Wonderland thing where the conservative patriots are going to join Al-Qaeda, but Al-Qaeda's good and works with NATO. There was a piece Saturday, or Sunday night rather, on NBC just before the Olympics where I think it was Bob Engel was on the ground with a supposed freedom-fighting group there in Syria in which their leadership said, either you give us arms or we're going to turn to al-Qaeda for help, for help. I mean, it was overt, undisguised, unvarnished war propaganda meant to you know, people the idea that unless we provide these people with money and arms, then they're going to turn to al-Qaeda. Well, well, that's the same thing. We've got to grow the opium and ship it to America and have the troops grow it in front of you or al-Qaeda will grow it. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Sure. sure, and of course, the entire purpose of this type of thing is to create in the public mind this idea that all these supposed threats and all these supposed enemies are compounded into one. If you hear somebody talking about the dangers of what the banking community, the, the banking interests are doing in our country, and talking about the dangers of impending martial law, that at some point, for those who consume uncritically what they're fed by the government allied media, they'd say, well, this sounds like the sort of radical stuff that these bearded savages overseas are saying. And so there'd be, I think, at least on the part of some segment of the public, a receptivity to the idea that the government has to do these horrible things in order to deal with insurrectionaries in Darlington, and South Carolina, or any place else in the country. The sort of thing that happened almost 20 years ago with respect to the Branch Davidians at Mount Carmel. The public was fed a, an incessant stream of dehumanizing propaganda, investing David Koresh and his followers with every manner of ugliness and viciousness. And so when... They were immolated by the federal government on day 51 of that siege. They deserved the first it. The reaction was on the part of people saying they deserved it. They had it coming to them. They're an evil, sexually deranged cult. And people tend to be malleable there. By the way, you just mentioned that, that, that Pentagon document. They had it on screen while you were just talking and I was reading it. It talks about checkpoints, not letting the food and water into Darlington, South Carolina, and then having the people exfiltrate out. I mean, I mean, this is martial law. This is what I've seen the military train for in the gun confiscation manuals. It says they're going to lock down and barricade cities. I mean, our government has been taken over by foreign banks. The military is being trained to be collaborators with this. It's that simple. And people, they're going to create a climate where they're going to force us to resist. That's why they're training for this. It is it is the total takeover of our society. Well, Will Gregg, I've always been impressed with your films. I've been impressed with your writing. I don't know why I never got you on the show. Uh, I mean, maybe over 17 years I might have talked to you once. Have I ever interviewed you before? No, I think this is my first time, and I appreciate it, Alex. Yeah, I've talked to Will Jasper and others. Well, great job. We need to get uh, Mr. McManus back on the show as well. Just had Bob Dacey in here a few weeks ago. Uh, thank you so much for your tireless work. You guys really are the proto-Tea Party. I mean, I, I, uh, you, I mean, you helped wake me up, and then I've helped wake up millions, and, and just God bless you, and thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for all the time. Thank you so much, Alex. God bless you. All right, goodbye. Uh, there goes uh, Will Gregor. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge?
What are you doing to unlock mine?